Hey guys, we want to welcome you back to The Loft Online. Tonight we are in week three of our series, New Me, where we're taking a study through Ephesians and seeing, man, what does it look like during this time to be preparing ourselves and meeting with the Lord in a way that the church walks into a new and better future uh, moving forward. And that if the church is going to walk into a new and better future, then you and I are going to have to do some work with the Lord for us to walk out looking new. And so tonight we're going to get the chance to look into what that new me looks like. But before we get started, um, I just want to pray with us. Uh, so if you're in bed or you're in your living room or in your backyard, um, just take a moment to pray as we begin to ask God to speak to us through tonight. Father, we thank you for this weird time in history um, where we find a place to still be committed to your word. God, we're thankful for what you've given us over the past few years in this room and in this ministry. And God, even though it feels weird to say, we're thankful for what you're giving us now. Still a chance to be able to encounter your word and let it change our lives. And Father, what we hope is that moving forward, whatever the other side of this looks like, uh, whatever a new normal looks like, God, that your church will be brighter and more vibrant and more mobile than ever before in order to reach our community for the sake of Jesus. So Father, tonight may you speak to us through this letter to the church at Ephesus. Father, we love you and we trust you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, we started this new me journey through the book um, of Ephesians, this letter to a church in a place called Ephesus. And what we've talked about in the last two weeks, and if you've missed it, you can go back on our YouTube channel and watch it um, and recap with it and let it speak to you as well. But in week one, we talked about that if you and I, if we're going to become new, we have to let God do a work in our lives that changes us from the inside out, that it can't just be new habits or new decisions or new relationships. We've got to let God change us from the inside out, really begin to change our hearts and our minds toward the gospel. And then last week, we said, hey, as God is doing that, it's going to look a lot like taking off old clothes and putting on new ones. That there are these things that we're going to constantly be putting off and then constantly putting on. That as we change, as we run from sin, there's a holiness and a righteousness that God is calling us to. And today we're going to talk about what does one of those things look like? What are one of those primary things? And there's a whole list of things that we could change, that we could put off, that we could put on. And in the midst of all of that, I do think that there's one thing at the center of it all, that, that if you and I are going to do well, and if the church is going to do well moving forward, then we want to do this thing really well. And I don't know about you, but during quarantine, I've um, had some time to do some different things. So I'm trying to catch up on reading. I get to spend infinitely more time with my kid, and we go on wagon rides and walks, and um, I get to work kind of in a different space and learn to work differently. But one of the things that I've actually really enjoyed as well is watching a little bit of television every now and then. Um, there are shows that I've wanted to catch up on or shows that I've wanted to see that normal life did not allow me to do, and I'm someone who doesn't really like working in silence, and I listen to a type of music that my house does not always enjoy that I listen to all the time. And so one of the things that I've done um, is I've gone back and watched one of my favorite shows from childhood, probably my favorite show of all time. And you can actually watch it too. If you get bored during quarantine and you want to go back um, and navigate the 90s a little bit, and you can watch a show called Boy Meets World. And Boy Meets World um, has been one of my favorite shows ever of all time. I've finished the entire series multiple, multiple, multiple times. I even have uh, the DVD set, but Disney Plus has granted us the ability uh, to watch the show as many times as we want all the way through. And so I've gone back and I've watched it over and over and over again. And some of the same feelings that I felt when I was a kid watching it um, even come about as I'm 27. And now as a 27-year-old watching it through different eyes, there are some things and some emotions that spring up that are totally different. But the thing about that show is that the premise of it all is that there are two characters, Corey and Topanga, the weirdest female name in probably television history um, as a major character. And the, the, the premise, the primary storyline throughout all of it, throughout the seven seasons, is that these are two kids who fall in love um, before they can even enter into grade school. And they have the longest standing relationship through their elementary years and teenage years and college years into marriage until you got a Girl Meets World reboot, which is them um, in their marriage and with their kid. And I go back and I watch that, and I remember watching that as a kid, 
and it beginning to form inside of me ideas about what love is. Because all throughout the show, it's answering questions of what does love look like, and what does it look like for these kids, and what does it look like for adults, and what does it look like in different settings, and it began very early to form inside of me an idea of what love might be, and what it might look like, and what I could hope for it to be. And then throughout life, as someone who loves media, and movies, and television, and music, letting some of those things begin to form an idea of love in me and really create a desire in me for love at different levels and navigating adolescence as, man, I I want uh, romantic love. Oh, man, this is what friendship love looks like. Oh, I grew up in a house where my parents love each other and where we love our siblings. That doesn't always make sense all the time. It doesn't always show itself, but, but by and large, like we love each other. And so now we're even collecting these ideas and different definitions of love as we go about. And, and the same thing has happened for you and is happening for you. You constantly are navigating ideas of what love is and whether you love your friends and whether you love your family and what that love looks like and, and the different attributes that are at place in all of those things. And you are forming an idea of love in your head. And we go, well, what does that have to do with being a new me? And what does it have to do with Christianity? And the reality is that you and I, if we were pressed we would say that the most attractional or the most well-known or the most talked about thing uh, within the realm of Christianity and the church, the thing that, that we would say, man, this gets people interested, the thing that we would say we're supposed to do well is love. Like if we were to talk about the person and work of Jesus, even people who wouldn't call themselves Christians, they would say, well, Jesus loved everybody. Jesus had a love that looked different than everybody else. They would say, uh, people who don't even want to walk into the church or even want to claim Christianity, would their main issue that they would probably take is that it doesn't look like they love the way that they believe God and Jesus to love. Because they're building their own definitions of love and what that looks like and how that plays out and, and who it's for. And the church, I think if we were to sit around and we were to say, what is the one thing we should do Well, I would like to think that we would get to a place where we would say, well, love is the one thing that we should do well. It's the thing that people are going to want to come to know Jesus. It's the thing that, as we read the New Testament, really attracts people to Jesus and and makes them want to hear his gospel. As you look through John, even the moment where Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead, he begins to tear up, and the people are in awe because they say, I mean, look how he loved him. And that should be the thing that we would go, man, we want to do that well. But the reality is, is you and I, even if we've only been at the loft for a semester, or maybe we've grown up in church for a long time, um, or we have an idea of what's going on, the reality is, is that the one thing that the church should be doing well, we often don't do very well at all. That the thing that should be pulling people into the message of the gospel was actually often pushing them away from the message of the gospel. And so what I think is if you and I And if the church and if our youth ministry is going to move forward and walk into a new reality where the church is brighter and more vibrant than before, then you and I are going to have to develop an idea and a mindset and a belief and an action in a new type of love. But the problem is is that you and I have been building this idea of love for a long time, and we've largely been doing it apart from Scripture. We've been doing it as we decide to date and through romantic relationships, and we feel that butterfly feeling for the first time, or someone pays attention to us for the first time. We've been doing it in the midst of our friendships and finding out where loyalties lie. We've been seeing it on display in our household where um, we could have parents who really love each other and are good examples of that, but we could also um, very easily have parents who maybe aren't great examples of that, and they struggle to show, man, this is what it looks like to love one another. And so as we're collecting all this data on love and building it in our database, I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out what it looks like, and then we come to the table with this idea of what love is, and then we're told that God is love, and a lot of times we don't actually let God then begin to define love. We let our idea of love define God, and we come up with a bad representation. And in the midst of that, in this letter to the church at Ephesus, as Paul is writing and he's talking about this new me, man, right after the passage where he's talking about a new me, he says these words, he says, there 
for. And so what he means, since everything before this is true of taking apart, taking off the old self and putting on the new, then this next thing also has to be true. And this is what this newness is going to look like. And this is what it says in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light and the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be imitators of God. At the center of this passage, before it begins to talk about love, it says that since you have put on the new, as you put on the new, as God is changing you from the inside out, as everything around you and within you is changing you are going to find that you are becoming an imitator of God. And as you imitate God, as his beloved children, walk in love. Be imitators of God. One of my favorite things at home right now is um, Emery is obsessed with shoes. And so but she knows that if she's putting on shoes, that means she's going to get to go outside. And so when we're getting ready to go outside, we go, Emery, where's your shoes? And, and Emery walks around the house and she goes, shoes? Shoes, uh, and it, it's the most like cutest thing of all time. It's fantastic. Um, but she doesn't just love her own shoes. She loves mom and dad's shoes. And so I may leave my shoes on the floor, and Emery will get excited. She finds them. She brings them to me. And what she wants me to do is to set her in my shoes so she can pretend as if she's like me. From She thinks it's hilarious. Look, I'm in dad's shoes. I'm going to begin to walk in dad's shoes to imitate him. Therefore, be imitators of God, our Father, as his children, that we would look like him. And we would walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. As it starts the love conversation, it leans into that at the center of love is sacrifice and giving yourself up. It says, you want to know what love is? Look to Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. See, so much, so many times, We look and we go, this is what I believe that love is, and so this may be who God is, but Scripture says this is who God is, and so this must be what love is. I think sometimes we look at Scripture and we go, this is a book that's going to tell us what to do or how to live, but it's actually a book of who God is and how he works throughout all of time. And so any moment in Scripture that God does anything, if he is love, then that thing is loving. And that's a hard way to navigate scripture. That doesn't always make sense to us. Why? Because sometimes we start with the idea of love and we try to put God in that box. But God is not to be put in a box. He is the box that we put love in. He is the great definer of love. Love is not the definer of him. And so if we're going to come out of a place of a new new future, a brighter future for the church, We're going to have to have a new understanding of love, and it starts with God. And as it starts with God, it hinges on sacrifice to give yourself up, that at the center of the Christian walk is not to just be a little bit better, to pray a little bit longer, to be a little bit more moral. It hinges on sacrificial love, that what Jesus does for us, we would be willing to do for others. 
And then it goes, it's so interesting, as it talks about love, it lists all these things, and it doesn't talk about, so be nice to people, hold doors open, like feed, feed the hungry, all these things, and, and the rest of scripture says things like that. But it actually leans into running from sexual immorality. Don't let there be any impurity. Don't let there be covetousness, which is just wanting, coveting what other people have. Don't let there be foolish talk. It begins to give maybe these rules or these commands that we get uncomfortable with because we go, oh man, Christianity, it's about relationship. It's not about rules, and that's true. But it's about a relationship defined by love, and everything that comes out of that is going to say, this is not loving. And so when Jesus gives commands, he's giving commands by saying, don't do this thing. Why? Because it's not loving. Sexual immorality outside of the confines by which God has designed it, it's not loving. It's about selfish desire, and it wreaks havoc on your relationships. And I'm, I'm in the business of good, healthy, God-glorifying relationships that don't damage. Wanting and desiring something, what could be wrong with that? Why? Because when you want something so deeply that you develop a bitterness for other people, it wreaks havoc on relationships. It gives you an inability to love. It gives you an inability to sacrifice of yourself, to sacrifice for your community, to sacrifice for your relationships, to one day sacrifice for your marriages, to sacrifice for your kids. Man, as that's changing and moving, the, the, at the center of that love is going to be a new definition. It's going to require us to give up a lot more than we will gain, or at least it will look like. Because it says that we would gain the kingdom of heaven. It goes on and it makes this statement. It says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He talks about the same thing again, which means clearly the church at Ephesus and the community around it was probably dealing in some of those things because there are other sins listed in other places um, that other like, specific sins are listed than what is going on right here. But sometimes we read that and we look at our own selves and we go, but wait a minute, I have a little bit of sexual immorality with me. I have a little bit of impurity within me, but I thought I gave my life to Jesus a long time ago, and so does that mean that I'm not going to go to heaven? And what I want you to know is, one, this is bigger than heaven. No inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. I mean, when you give your life to Jesus, you begin to inherit the kingdom now. You begin to live in light of the kingdom now. That's been our whole push for a whole year in student ministry, that following Jesus is living in the kingdom now. And so it's not just about where you will go one day. It's about you're not reaping the benefits of living in the kingdom of God now by living in that sin. And as you continually develop a habit of sin, you continually lose out on living in that kingdom. And if you are continually living in that sin, we do have to be able to ask the question, did I ever become a new me? Therefore, is the original statement true so that this statement can be true? That I give my life to Jesus so I can develop a new love. And that means that we're going to have to sacrifice our own desires, our own ideas, even our own thoughts or beliefs about what love is and begin to let God define love in our life. And to know that he is king and he is doing a better job of that than we are. If we're going to be a new me or a new we, we're going to have to develop a better idea of love. And that means that when we're back in this room or if we're wherever we're at this summer in the way that we worship, if we're in uh, different relationships that, that we need to be able to love each other and sacrifice on behalf of one another. See, some people come into our room all the time and they don't actually feel love or develop a love because our small groups are places of gossip and not places of glorifying God. If we are going to walk into a fall and we're hopeful and prayerful that, that maybe we'll be back in this room and filling this room up in the fall, and the truth is, is in the last few years, God has done an incredible thing in our ministry and grown it, not just in size, but the depth, the conversations that I have with you. You know the Lord better than you did just a few years ago, but if he's going to do that again next year, we're going to move in that direction next year, then you and I, we better develop a new idea of what love is. Not let our love define our God, but let our God define our love. Because he defined it with Jesus on the cross. And that is the type of just sacrifice, of sacrificial love that you and I should adopt for one another. And that for those of us that don't know Jesus, know that every rule, every law, every command that, that 
people are writing to these churches going forward, they all hinge on love. Would you be willing to give your life to a Jesus who's going to transform your idea of love and it's going to look better than you ever thought or imagined or could ever define for yourself? Would you be willing to give your life to that Jesus who's going to change your idea of love and it will open up a world, a kingdom, if you will, of possibilities? One of my favorite moments usually going into the summers that I hope we get to experience some this summer are these moments where, where you and I, we may be in a room at camp or we may be in a room at a mission trip and we get in a little bit of a smaller community and I think one of the ways that God begins to move in those rooms is a lot of times a conversation plays out and we go into what's basically a family meeting. We go into a share time of sharing what God is doing and almost maybe 50% of our conversations in that room talk about our love for one another. Talk about our love for God that he's drawing us into. Talk about how our idea of love is changing and our idea of how God loves us is changing and our idea of how we should love each other is changing or even our idea of how we should love our community that we return to is changing. See, we take in those moments, in these fixed moments, and we let God begin to to take off the old and put on the new for us and he's putting on this new love. And some of my favorite moments, because I get to enter into them and I get to look at the teenagers that I love, at the teenagers that I miss, and lean into it and say, hey, I I want you to know this, that I love you. And I say that because I, I try desperately to be the best version of myself and the closest to God that I can be and that I want you to know that every action that I take is in hopes that it would draw you closer to God because that is love, to sacrifice of myself, that you would come closer to God. But in those moments, I also pause because my hope is that however much that I love you, however much your small group leader loves you, however much your, your parent who loves the Lord loves you, all of that love comes from God. The ability to love comes from God. My hope is that they're following God close enough that their love is being defined by God. And that's why I pause to always communicate that. Because if the closest that you get to the love of God first comes from a love from the people on this stage, I'm always hopeful that it's small steps to a new kind of love. Will you continue to let your idea of love define your God? Or will you let God define your love? That will make the difference in the future. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for tonight. God, if I'm honest, I've been wrong about my definition of love for the vast majority of my life. And you are constantly changing that definition within me. That every day, I'm finding out what it looks like to sacrifice of myself on behalf of other people. And most times I don't do it well, but God, when I am, the love that I experience, the love that I see, the love that that moves out, and the love that I receive, I can tell that it's from God and it's better than my poor definition of love. Father, as you're changing your people during this time, may you change us into a people that have a new kind of love. And that in everything we do, just as in everything that you do, we start with love. Father, we love you and we trust you. And this is my prayer. Amen. Thank you.